Thank you. So I imagine that from time to time, we all have one of those days, right? The other morning for me was just one disaster after another. And by the time I got to my office, I was already wishing uh, that I had just foregone the day and not even gotten out of bed. And I happened to run into one of my colleagues in the hallway outside of my office and she said, do you need a hug? And I said, yes, so much. And you know, when she put her arms around me and hugged me, it didn't change anything about what had gone wrong in my day, but it changed everything about the way that I felt about it. I could feel my stress going away, being less overwhelmed, feeling much better able to cope with all of the things that had gone wrong uh, up to that point that morning. And it's yet another example for me of, I think, the real power of pro-social communication. I think about a gesture that small, right, that quick, just a, a brief hug in the hallway. Uh, but what an important and profound effect it had on my day. And I'm sure that you can think of many examples of that in your own lives when You've just been going through a stressful time and a hug or someone patting you on the back or a call from your mom and suddenly you just feel a whole lot better about whatever happens to be going wrong. I find that fascinating and for the last uh, 20 years almost, I've been studying the question of why do we share affection with people in our lives and why does it have some of the beneficial effects that it does. So I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be able to share uh, a little bit of my work with you. I can't really see any of you uh, at the moment, but I know you're out there. And, uh, and thank you so much for, uh, for being here. What I'd like to do with our time tonight uh, is talk, first of all, about pro-social communication in general terms. What is it about communicating with people in positive ways uh, that's so important to us, so much uh, ingrained in uh, who we are as human beings. And I want to segue from that into talking uh, in much more detail about what's been the focus of my work for the last two decades, and that's the communication of affection. Uh, and finally, we'll end with um, some conclusions, I think. They're qualified conclusions, but I think that things that um, we can reasonably say uh, based on what we know so far. So let's talk about pro-social communication for a moment and begin with the observation that we humans are certainly very social beings, right? Among the most social uh, of certainly of all the primates. And yet that doesn't necessarily mean that we're always pro-social. When you think about human relationships, and, and I study families often, this is absolutely true in families, it's quite amazing how a single relationship can be so positive and so negative at the same time. I often ask my students if this is true in their own families, and without fail, uh, they can nominate relationships. I don't know how many of you grew up with siblings, for example. But those are a, a good example of a relationship that can be very, very positive and also very, very negative. It's amazing what some kids do to each other when they're growing up. Um, I have two younger siblings, and my younger brother uh, loves to remind me now, since we're both adults, of things that I did to him and said to him uh, when we were children, and then often revisit those upon me. Uh, he's a police officer and about this much taller than me, so... Um, he's, you know, he's having his revenge. Um, so I think the fact that we interact with people in ways that are both positive and negative, and often intensely so in both directions, makes pro-social communication um, important to ask questions about, important to focus on. What is it about that type of interaction and communication uh, that makes it worth our attention? we can think about uh, what I'm just broadly calling pro-social communication as comprising a number of specific behaviors. I'm going to talk about affection, of course, but that's really only one type. We can think about the expression of compassion, which certainly is a big focus here, the expression of altruism, behaviors that convey our trust in other people, 
Anything that we do behaviorally that helps us build or maintain positive connections with other people that's really under the umbrella of pro-social communication. Now, my focus for the last several years has been on the communication of affection, and I think that, uh, like many people, oh, there you are, I'm out of the light now. <laughs> I think like many people, like many researchers, um, I tend to study those things that, uh, as an individual, as a person, I find intriguing or confusing. So I grew up in a very affectionate family. We were all over each other when I was growing up. And so I go out into the world as an adolescent believing, I think like a lot of us do, that what's true in my family is true in every family. So if I'm very affectionate and that's a very important part of, of who I am and how I relate to others, I assume that everybody will be this way. Well, surprise, they're not. And I discover as an adolescent especially that not only is everyone not affectionate, but not everybody likes that. And often when you inter interact with people in the way that uh, is normative to you, uh, you find that it's not well received. And that, that confused me. That intrigued me for a long time. Uh, so I've put my focus on affection as a scholar because it's really, for me as an individual, been sort of a mystery for so long. How could someone not like Affection. That was a mystery to me for a long time. Well, what do we mean when we talk about affection? We really mean two things. We can talk about the emotional experience of affection. We can think of it as uh, an emotional and psychological entity that really comprises our feelings of love and fondness for others. And, and those others might be other people, our romantic partners, our family, our close friends. Uh, certainly we feel very affectionate toward our pets, um, some guys toward their cars, you know, whatever. Whatever is the target of our affection, it's the feelings of love and fondness and connection uh, that really comprise the emotional aspect of affection. But then, of course, it's also a behavior. What I distinguish from affection as affectionate communication. The behaviors that we use to convey our emotional sense of affection. And I say here in parentheses, whether accurately or inaccurately. And it turns out this is quite an important distinction. We have the ability to feel affection for others without expressing it. So to have the emotional experience of it without the behavioral experience. And there may be many um, situations, many reasons why we would choose not to convey our feelings of love for somebody else. It may be early in a relationship, for example. And you don't necessarily want to be the first person to say, I love you in this new burgeoning relationship. I don't know how many of you remember the episode of Seinfeld when George wants to say, I love you, and Jerry says, if, you, if she doesn't say it back, that's a pretty big matzo ball hanging out there, <laughs> right? Well, that's a stressful situation, right? Because affection is highly reciprocal as a behavior. So if you say it or you express it and it's not reciprocated, that's pretty stressful. We may choose not to put ourselves in that situation. However, we can also express affection when we don't really feel it, right? That's also an inaccurate uh, match between the behavior uh, and the emotion. Now, of course, we can do this with a lot of emotions, right? Uh, I do this often when I get um, Christmas presents from my grandmother, which, you know, she's getting up in years and I doesn't really know what I want at all. So I, but I, I you know, I can't say that to grandma. I got to express happiness. I got to express gratitude for, for the things that she gives me. And, and we do this often in the service of politeness. Uh, and that would be a, a good example. But we also can express affection to other people that we're not really feeling at the time. And often we do that for very manipulative purposes. Uh, we might do it to get some, something from that other person or to persuade that other person in some way. Uh, sometimes people do it to initiate sexual interaction. Anybody who grows up uh, and, and has children is familiar with the phenomenon of your child coming to you and saying, you know, I really love you. And you say, what do you want? Right? So even children understand that we can get things that we want from others by expressing affection, even if 
that affection isn't genuine in the moment. I'm going to come back to this point a little bit later, but that's an important distinction for now. When we just think about the behaviors, though, that we use to express feelings of affection, accurately or inaccurately, we really can divide those into different categories of behavior. Certainly, we have verbal expressions. This would be anything that we say or anything that we write, anything in the form of words. We have what I think of as direct nonverbal expressions of affection, things like hugging, kissing, hand-holding, uh, and, and those types of behaviors. And then finally, we have ways of communicating affection that are more covert. So I may show affection for a friend of mine by doing them a favor uh, or acknowledging uh, a milestone in their life or doing some things that we really would otherwise perceive as just socially supportive. Yet I know within the confines of that relationship, it's going to be decoded as an expression of my love and care for that other person. Now, it's absolutely true when we think about affectionate communication that it's a rule-governed behavior. And to some extent, we learn the rules, um, cultural rules, social rules, even context-specific rules for communicating affection just from our own interaction. It varies certainly in its form, the way we show it, and in its frequency, how often we show it, by a number of things. Certainly our culture, the sex and the sex composition of our relationships. Uh, women often tend to be more expressive of affection than men, but that's not true in every type of relationship. So the type of relationship matters. People express affection uh, differently in their families than they do in, uh, in more social relationships often. And even the social setting, where we may see uh, people being affectionate, say, in a bar or a party or a social scene in ways that we wouldn't expect them to be, let's say, in church. Right? So the context uh, matters as well. What really doesn't tend to vary, though, especially if we look across cultures, is the presence of affection. So we see variance in how and when affection is communicated between people in a culture, but not really in whether it's communicated. Uh, it's somewhat more ubiquitous type of behavior than, um, than it may seem if we just look at the variation in form and frequency across cultures. Now, I talked a minute about, ago about not being the first one to say I love you in a relationship, and that's certainly a risky position sometimes to be in. It turns out that expressing affection carries a number of risks. It's not always easy to do, and sometimes we have to weigh the benefits against the risks, and there are several. Certainly the risk of non-reciprocity is one. That's, that was the example that I gave before. What if I say it and they don't say it back? You know, it's somewhat like unrequited love uh, in that instance, and it creates certainly a very stressful situation within that relationship. But that's not the only risk. There's a risk of misinterpretation. What if I say I love you to someone else, and I mean it, let's say, platonically, but it's interpreted romantically? So I might say it to a platonic friend of mine who's now wondering, well, where, is this, where are you going with this? What does this mean now for the scope and the nature of our relationship? Are you trying to change um, the reality between us? There's a risk of social or cultural censure when I engage in communication behaviors, affectionate or, or otherwise, really, uh, that are not appropriate for that cultural or social context. So I mentioned the difference between how people act at a party versus how they act at church. I would expect certainly to be censured in some way if I engage in affectionate behaviors that aren't appropriate for that social setting or if I'm elsewhere in the world that aren't appropriate for that culture. And then finally, there's a risk of disease transmission. This seems like an odd one to throw in the mix of what are really otherwise social risks of affection. Uh, but of course, affectionate communication often involves a lot of intimate contact between people. Uh, touch and salivary exchange and things that make it easy to transmit uh, 
uh, communicable disease. And of course, most of us tend to curtail those types of behaviors. We don't go around kissing people when we're sick. All right, we understand that. Uh, but we understand it because we realize uh, that there's a risk involved. It turns out, though, that affection is risky not only for those of us who express it. Uh, there are also risks associated with receiving expressions of affection. And to some extent, these mirror uh, the same types of risks we talked about before. A risk of expressing affection is that it won't be reciprocated, but a risk of receiving affection is feeling obligated to reciprocate it. Maybe you've been in that situation yourselves when someone has said, I love you to you. And on one hand, you don't really feel it. You don't really want to say it back to them. It doesn't seem natural to you in that moment. But on the other hand, you may feel a real sense of obligation not to let that gesture hang out there, right? So that's a risk of receiving it. Relational boundary ambiguity is certainly another risk. If there's misinterpretation of the expression, or even if there isn't, receiving an affection of expression that is in any way ambiguous can create some ambiguity in my mind about the boundaries of our relationship. Well, I thought we were friends. And now you're telling me you love me. Well, what does this mean? What does this mean for you? What does this mean for us? And then finally, and this is what I wanted to come back to from the example of your, your child, telling you that they love you is the risk of manipulation. So when people express affection to me, one possibility is that they're doing it in order to get something from me. Now that doesn't seem very polite. And let's be honest, it's not. But a number of years ago, I wanted to find out how common it was for people to do that. Um, and college students are people too. So I surveyed college students, about a thousand, uh, at schools around the country. Uh, so not just those in, in my own backyard. And I asked them, have you ever expressed affection to someone else when you didn't really feel it, but you had some other goal in mind? You wanted something else from that person. Out of those thousand students, how many of you, or how many would you guess, what percentage would you guess, said, yeah, I've done that? How many of you would think 50%? 60? More, 70, kind of a cynical audience here. 88% of the students said, yeah, I've done that, sure. To their parents. Oh, to a number of people. You know, I asked them, if you've done this, tell me about the situation, right? Who was it? What did you do or say? And most important, what were you after, right? What was your actual goal? And the actual goals really ranged. A, a lot of them were pro-social. So I didn't really love the person, but I said it because I didn't want them to feel bad or I was trying to comfort them in a distressed time. You know, things that weren't necessarily self-centered. And then you had those that very much were. I was trying to get money. I was trying to get her to sleep with me, right? Any number of, of, of very self-centered, very manipulative goals. By the way, of that 88% who said, yes, I've done this, more than half of them said that they had done it within the previous week. So much more common, much more ubiquitous than, well, at least than I hoped. I don't know what I really expected, but uh, more common than I hoped. And when you think about affection and affectionate communication in these terms, all these risks, uh, I think it's fair to ask ourselves, why is this something that we do at all? Why is communicating affection part of our behavioral repertoire as human beings? And I'm going to argue that when you think about that question, despite all of the risks, that the answer really is that communicating affection for us as human beings is part of our behavioral repertoire because it goes beyond the level of something that we enjoy or even something that we desire and rises to the level of something that we need. So this really is the basis of my theoretic orientation to affection is that it's a fundamental 
human need. Such that when we don't meet our needs for affection, we suffer in much the same way as we suffer when we don't meet our other fundamental human needs, when we don't eat or we don't drink or we don't sleep. Those things have very detrimental effects on us, both physically and psychologically. And it turns out that when we lack a sufficient amount of affection in our lives, the same is true. So it's not enough just to be loved or even just to know that I am loved. I genuinely have a need, I believe, to be shown that I am loved. Now, I think about the genesis of that need in somewhat primal terms. So I think about, for instance, the advanced state of dependency in which we're born as humans, certainly relative to uh, most anyone else in the animal kingdom. As a brand new newborn, right, I don't have any of the faculties to be self-sufficient. And as any of you know who have children, it's not a matter of weeks or months or even years before I'm going to gain self-sufficiency. Often it's decades, right? And in the meantime, and especially in the early part of my life, I absolutely need someone to provide for my needs or I perish. And what I'm asking for as a newborn is not a drop in the bucket, right? You know that every year the federal government estimates the amount of money it costs to raise a child just through age 18, right? Just through the end of high school. That's not including Stanford tuition or anything beyond that. And it's pushing 300 grand now per child. And of course, that's just the monetary investment. There's the investment of your time, your energy, your emotional investment, your lost opportunity. So what is it that actually motivates us as human beings to make that level of investment in a newborn? Well, if you ask a brand new mother that, that seems like a ridiculous question. Why do you take care of your baby? Right? If you ask most of us, that seems like an odd question to ask. Well, because it's not, I don't even think about it. Of course I'm going to invest in that child and meet its every need and take care of it to nurture it and help it to survive. Why? Because I love that child, and that's the point. We have built in to our psychological experience the feelings of overwhelming love and affection for that newborn, such that all of this expensive and prolonged investment seems worth it to us. We have evolved that kind of sensation just the same way that we've evolved the sensation of hunger to motivate us to eat or the sensation of fatigue to motivate us to sleep. Those are fundamental human needs and especially for that newborn, the affection motivating that investment of resources is a fundamental human need. We can really think of affection in these terms as being literally a matter of life or death. And of course, it turns out that our need for affection doesn't disappear after infancy, right? For the rest of our lives, we still need to belong. As those from the psychology field know, our need to belong, also very fundamental as a, as a human motivation. When we lack sufficient affection, the situation I spoke of earlier, some people call that skin hunger or affection deprivation, it's associated with a lot of problems, a lot of highly detrimental, both psychological and physical states. So this is a need that we start our lives with and that follows us all the way through. Let's think about some observations with respect to affection. First of all, and perhaps even most significant for my line of thinking, it feels good. It feels good when our child tells us that he or she loves us. It feels good when we kiss a romantic partner or a friend puts his arm around us. When I got a hug from my colleague uh, on my very stressful morning, it felt good. And it feels good to us, not just emotionally, not just psychologically, it feels good physically, 
right? There are things transpiring in the body that produce a rewarding sensation associated with receiving an expression of affection. Now, that's not unilaterally true. We all have had those experiences when we received affection from other people, especially physical affection, and had quite the opposite reaction, right? We had a stress response. Don't hug me, don't touch me, get away from me, stand over there, please, right? We've all had those situations. And of course, um, that's relevant to our next point here, that affection isn't the kind of behavior that normatively we engage in with just anyone. A lot of communication behaviors, of course, we uh, engage in with people across our relational spectrum. But for the most part, we reserve our affection for our most significant relationships. Our marriage, our romantic partnerships, our families, our very close friends. And that's significant as well, which leads me to the conclusion that it's not an accident that affection is part of our behavioral repertoire, that it evolved for a reason. And if I assume that, then I can think about, well, what are those reasons? What are the things that affection gives me as a human being, both individually and relationally? So I wonder, as an empiricist, how is something like affectionate communication as a form of pro-social behavior related to things like the health of my personal relationships? How is it related to my mental well-being? And especially, how is it related to my physical health? These are some of the questions that my research team and I have focused a lot of our attention on over the last number of years. Well, let's start with relational health, and I think we can certainly make the general observation here that affectionate communication matters for our close relationships. Often when significant relationships like marriages are dissolving, it's the lack of affection that is cited as a contributing factor, often the contributing factor, to the demise of that relationship. So what I want to do now is walk through, and I'm just going to do it in an, in an overview manner, some of the things that we have found over the years that are relevant for understanding the benefits of affectionate communication in our lives. And we'll start with relationships. This first set of findings has to do with comparing people, comparing individuals and their relationships based on what I think of as their trait level of affectionate communication. Now, obviously, we communicate affection in different ways, in different relationships, in different contexts. That's absolutely true. Yet, on top of that, we can think of ourselves, each of us individually, as being perhaps a highly affectionate person or a moderately affectionate person or someone who's really not at all. I grew up in an affectionate family. I would categorize, categorize myself as a highly affectionate person on this far end of that continuum. And it turns out that when we look at that as a trait, as a characteristic of the way that people interact, most of the time in most of their relationships, we find that highly affectionate people are more likely than people at the lower end of that continuum, first of all, just even to be in a significant romantic relationship, a long-term partnership or a marriage. And then for those who are, they're much more likely to be satisfied with that romantic relationship. So right away, we see a connection between affection and just the positivity of relationships that exist. We can also think about affection at the relational level, right? Even people who are not particularly affectionate as a trait may be in a very affectionate relationship. And when we look at it at the relational level, we see that relationships, whether they're romantic or not, romantic, platonic, familial, that are characterized by a high level of affectionate communication are benefited relative to those that are not in terms of a number of indices of relational positivity, how close people feel, how much they say they like and love each other, their relationship satisfaction, and their communication satisfaction, their happiness with the way that they interact. 
So all of those are, well, examples of associations between affection and relational positivity, but they don't, they're not necessarily causal, right? Um, it turns out, though, that when we experimentally induce increased affection in relationships, we can produce benefits from that. We can produce increases in things like relational satisfaction, positivity, relationship stability. And we've done this in a couple of ways experimentally. One is by having people write about their feelings of affection. We call these our love letters experiments. Uh, write about how much they love each other and why what are the characteristics about that person that, uh, that really spark your love for them? And in one of our more interesting studies, we asked people in our experimental condition to kiss more. Just go home and kiss your partner more, more than you typically would. And I think this, was a, this particular study was a six-week trial, so they kept getting emails from me saying, are you kissing? Right? Smooch, smooch. So... This is back before Twitter, so I didn't have that as an option, but I tried to keep reminding them, and that was all they were asked to do. And if, if, over the course of that six-week period, we produced some uh, increases in their indices of, of relational positivity. So for relationships, uh, by and large, we can say that there are, are genuine benefits associated with, and in some cases, causally, uh, with the expression of affection. Now, recognize that we're not necessarily manipulating the expression, uh, the, the affectionate emotion, right? We're not necessarily um, tweaking the way that people feel about each other as much as we are the extent to which they convey that in their relationships. It turns out that affection and, and affectionate communication is also associated with a number of indices of mental health and mental well-being. And again, we look at affection in these types of studies um, as a trait. Again, overall, people who tend to be more affectionate in their lives tend also to be happier and less lonely, more socially engaged, less susceptible to chronic stress, um, they score lower on indices of alexithymia, uh, which is impairment of their ability to um, interpret other people's emotional expressions. They report being less depressed, and they are less likely than people at the other end of the continuum to have been diagnosed with things like mood disorders and anxiety disorders. Again, all associational findings, but they do help to paint the same type of picture with individuals that we see with relationships. That the tendency to be affectionate is associated with a number of other benefits mentally. In the last few years, my graduate students and I have turned our attention to uh, the physical experience of affection. And I, I think as I go back to the example that I opened with, that one of the reasons that affection and the expression of affection can be so beneficial for us uh, is that it can help us to manage stress. It can help us not to overreact to stressful situations or to cope with them better. Um, and so I've wondered about what is it that affectionate communication does to the body and what is it associated with in the body that might be relevant to things like my ability to manage and cope with and respond more beneficially uh, to stressors. So again, just a number of um, illustrative findings from our work compared to less affectionate people, and again, we're talking on the continuum here. Uh, highly affectionate people, well, for one, they have higher cytotoxicity in their natural killer cells, one index of the strength of their immune response. Uh, they don't have more natural killer cells, but the ones that they have are more cytotoxic. They're more effective in uh, killing the cells that they are intended to kill. They recover physically from acute stress uh, more rapidly. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this as we go, so we'll move on from that bullet point. One of the things that we've discovered in recent research is that when people who are highly affectionate are faced with stressful situations, one of the things that happens in their body is that they have a significant elevation 
in the hormone oxytocin. And we've begun to speculate that this is at least in part responsible for what I'm going to talk about in a minute as being a stress buffering effect of high levels of affection in our lives. Oxytocin, as you may know, has a number of calming and pain relieving effects on the body when it's elevated. And so the idea that I would be experiencing an increase in oxytocin during a, stressing, a stressful situation that is linearly predicted by my level of affection to us is significant, to us is telling. People who are highly affectionate also have more differentiated cortisol rhythms over um, the diurnal period, over the 24 hour period. As you may know, uh, the more differentiated our levels of cortisol over the day, um, the better able our HPA axis, our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is uh, at responding to stressors. So a healthy uh, rhythm is one that's highly differentiated over the 24 hour period. And especially when people are experiencing chronic stress, often what happens to them is that their diurnal rhythm flattens out. I want to show you some uh, examples from this particular study. Um, we took uh, measures of cortisol over a day, four time periods in this particular study, and compared them um, according to the level of trait affection that people reported. And just for illustrative purposes, I've pulled out here the, uh, the graph of cortisol levels for the most affectionate person in the study. This was the person whose trait level of, of affection was highest. It actually was a man, which is quite interesting because on average, women score higher on this scale than men do. But this is what his cortisol rhythm looked like. And of course, this is a very healthy looking rhythm. This is what we hope that all of ours uh, look like. When we look though, at the cortisol rhythm of the person in the study with the lowest level of trait affection, we really see the contrast. So this, of course, is a very unhealthy uh, cortisol rhythm. Um, and we can see, of course, that the average levels of cortisol were higher for the more affectionate person than the less affectionate one. But really, what really matters is the differentiation, is the variation over the 24-hour period. And so this tells us that there's a clear link um, and the beta in this study was, was pretty high. It was in the 50s for the association between trait affection level and the amount of variance uh, over the day. Compared to less affectionate people, we see some other benefits physically. Highly affectionate people have lower glycated hemoglobin, an index of our average blood sugar level. Um, and there's some evidence to suggest that this also can be elevated by stress, even in non-diabetics. So we see a, 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 a linear negative association there. People who are highly affectionate also experience less physiological arousal, more of a blunted physiological response to stressors. But here's our one um, somewhat distressing finding. They also have higher antibodies to latent Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, and this, I think, is a good example of affection having both positive and risky um, components to it. That when we're affectionate with people, often, especially in our intimate relationships, there's a lot of intimate contact that goes on. And so we have the opportunity to share uh, illness, to share disease. Um, I don't think it's uh, escaped our attention that Epstein-Barr virus leads to mono, also known as the kissing disease. So we think about it as something that um, besides all of the benefits, it's also a risk. It's a risk of being intimate with others. I said I wanted to come back to this point and talk a little bit about uh, what we think of as the stress buffering uh, effect of affectionate communication. And this is theoretically along the same lines of uh, the stress buffering hypothesis in the social support literature, which tells us that when people have a great deal of social and emotional support in their lives, they tend not to overreact to stressors, right? There's a buffering or protective effect um, that helps them react in a, within a, a more narrow window 
And we see the same effect as it turns out with affectionate behavior. When people are affectionate immediately before encountering a stressful situation, uh, that tempers their physiological arousal. But it's not just immediately, even up to a week before. We look at the amount of affection people have shared over a week's period uh, preceding exposure to the stressor. Even then, uh, there's a stress buffering benefit. Um, their physiological reactivity is blunted compared to people who don't have as much uh, affection preceding that. So I think that all of these correlational studies, all of these experiments, all of this data together uh, support what are at least some qualified conclusions that we can draw uh, about the nature of affection and its benefits for us. And I, I think certainly first of those is, is just an acknowledgement that affectionate communication is fairly ubiquitous among humans as a type of pro-social communication. Once again, we see variation across social groups, across cultural groups, in how and when affection is communicated, but we don't really see substantial variation in whether it's communicated. This is somewhat um, a human universal when you think about it behaviorally. And I think that's important to note because it helps us to understand that um, the communication of affection is not an accident. It's not an evolutionary fluke to us, but uh, perhaps it evolved for a, a more substantial reason. We can make the claim, certainly, that affectionate communication is at least associated with, and sometimes causally so, with the quality of our close relationships, with our mental and our physical well-being. With respect to relational quality, of course, we can really make this claim only in relationships that are already established and positive because that's the realm, by and large, in which we engage in affectionate behavior. And sometimes people have asked me to contextualize the findings and say, well, so what you're really telling me to do is just go out and start hugging everybody and kissing everybody. I said, yeah, that's you know, likely to lead to things like incarceration, um, where you may also have increased affection, uh, but not necessarily the variety that you, that you want. So by and large, as we contextualize our, our relational findings, we're thinking about our close established relationships already. But even within those, we can make the claim that increasing affectionate behavior often can have stress buffering and stress recovery benefits. So that if I choose to be more affectionate with the people around me, that may help me, first of all, not to overreact to stressful events, and secondly, to recover from them faster when I do, to get back to a state of homeostasis more quickly uh, than if I don't have as much affection in my life. And for me, if I think about these as a, at a policy level, one of the things that strikes my attention is the ubiquity of no-touch policy, uh, particularly in, in school environments, in work environments. I absolutely understand the importance of curtailing and preventing things like child abuse, like sexual harassment. Once again, there's no way to uh, promote unqualified, uncontrolled uh, expression of, of, of affection in our lives. And yet, I wonder, given our need for affection and given the benefits that we experience when we engage that need, whether absolutely banning it from some of our most important social contexts is really a justifiable approach. I read recently about a child, I think he was probably in middle school, who was, um, well, kicked out of his school. He was um, at least put on, uh, on, on detention, um, not for getting in the fist fight that he got into with his fellow classmate, but for hugging the teacher who broke it up. <laughs> 
That's why he got expelled. Not for fighting, but for loving, right? And so I think about children, especially younger children, who are in distress in a situation like that and who absolutely need affection and touch and contact, especially from a trusted adult like their teacher. And I wonder what kind of harm we're doing when that teacher then is curtailing that behavior out of fear of losing his or her job. Is it throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Perhaps. I would suggest that we all have a group hug <laughs> now to, uh, to close out our talk, but uh, instead I'm just going to thank you for letting me be here tonight. I appreciate it. <laughs>